Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. A while ago I went to the art museum and I decided to buy a few comics for the flight home. So I think I tweeted a few pics from this when I was reading it at the airport. And uh, I dig it and it's prompting thoughts. My very first video was Akira Himakawa's tw uh, Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. And going back, you don't have to go back to those early videos because I was really kind of trembling and trying to find my voice, I think, and I wasn't even sure what my point was, but what I think I was getting at was I was very passionate and excited and I started making videos because what clicked for me was that if the third wave feminist academics got their way, things I love like The Legend of Zelda or Super Mario Brothers wouldn't be allowed to exist anymore or they'd have to fundamentally change until they were something completely foreign. And stories like this, this was a, this is a reprint of Nintendo Power Comics from 1992 to 1993, and they were published originally in some manga that I've never heard about, so that might just be some interesting research for me to go look up later, because I'm curious what this looked like in the original. Did they have to flip the art? What'd they do? But uh, the, the, the point is that this kind of thing has problematic elements, and... Uh, the thing about problematic stories is that uh, they're viewed by academic feminists as being created by patriarchy and creating patriarchy. So it's not a simple cause-effect relationship. It's a chicken-egg relationship. The Su Super Mario Brothers creates toxic masculinity and rape culture, and then rape culture and toxic masculinity creates the next generation of problematic Super Mario Brothers ad infinitum. But and the the goal of putting bringing a radical feminist politics into these things is to take out the problematic elements and make them I don't know let make them less problematic. They're, they they use the word problematic because it's viewed as a problem that damsel in distress stories exist. And that's before Mario Brothers going back to grim fairy tales and Cinderella. So uh, what I said in my very first video on the Zelda manga is they have a point, but they take it too far. If all their point was was that Princess Peach shouldn't just be a damsel in distress, it's better for her if she's actually a character that you appreciate and connect with. That's good because it's good to have more characters you love rather than less characters you love. She, Princess Peach is more interesting as a character than she is as a MacGuffin, but they don't just stop there. Then it becomes, this creates rape culture. This creates patriarchy. This must stop. And this, the sense I get is that they want things like this to be essentially treated like racist caricatures in old Bugs Bunny cartoons, where these companies either try to pretend this stuff didn't exist, or if they do bring any of this stuff back, it gets a little note at the front saying, this is very problematic and sexist, and it was wrong then, and it's wrong now. And uh, that it, I essentially see all stories being neutered, essentially, to make them not problematic. If, if, if your story has any heart or drama to it, someone's going to take issue with it. And this is the kind of thing where, you know, a parent might look at this and say, oh, no, what, am, what is my three-year-old being exposed to? But sometimes good storytelling is going to have, you know, bad, bad characters doing bad things, or it's going to have some humor that may not be, you know, the, the most polite grant humor you use for when you have Christmas with your conservative grandma. You know, storytelling needs to be, have a little bit of adventure to it and a little bit of experimentation to it. So I am thinking about the character of Princess Peach and Mario a lot, but I think I'm just going to start digging into the story and I'll let those thoughts crop up as I go. I really want to see the Japanese original because I don't know how this could have been Americanized because this reads left to right. I doubt they published it left to right in Japan, although the compositions are somewhat westernized. Uh, things like Luigi's cap are normal. The L isn't backwards. So does that mean they flipped it and then went in and individually rearranged everything to make it read left to right to Ninten for Nintendo Power? I don't know. So uh, that's just a little cultural thing I'm curious about. So this version of the characters, 1993, uh, the Super Nintendo has come out. So really, all you've got is Super Mario Brothers, uh, 
Super Mario 2 based on Doki Doki Panic, which wasn't originally a Super Mario Brothers game, but they just kind of plopped the Mario Brothers characters on that Japanese game. Super Mario Brothers 3 and Super Mario World for Super Nintendo. So you don't really have that much to work with. Uh, this is the age where Mario is pretty much just like 10 pixels tall on a screen. He's not a character. Luigi's not a character. Uh, Princess Toadstool isn't a character yet. None of them are characters. So, of course, they're relying on simple storytelling tropes. They're not worried about telling stories. They're worried about making games. So, uh, Kentaro Takekuma and Charlie Nozawa have the problem of adapting what are essentially blank, blank slate characters. And you can tell they had some creative freedom in telling a story about these characters, and they started giving them personalities. So Luigi, who throughout this comic is called Weege, uh, I think it, it's so close to being Ouija the meme that I'm just gonna call him Ouija for the sake of simplicity. And uh, so Ouija is cowardly, tremulous, but still still does the brave thing when it counts. That He's got that type of personality. Mario is generic adventure dude. Uh, Princess Peach, they decided to make her kind of a badass, fight, feisty type who, who kicks a lot of butt, right? So they, they had these kind of very simple ideas for characters, and they added that on top of what were, at this point, just little pixelated characters. Uh, and one of the aspects I really like about this is the Mario, Mario, Luigi, and Peach are the kind of characters who you could have been reimagined in multiple ways and could continue to be reimagined in multiple ways. But the newest versions of them are kind of corporate mascots where they aren't doing anything really risky or adventurous with them like this comic is anymore. I guess they're doing a movie with Sony and Illumination, the, the people who make the Minions movies. They're going to make a Mario Brothers movie. So who knows? Maybe they're going to kind of resurrect these characters and do something fun with them. But... Uh, my impression is they kind of did really w wild and experimental stuff with them, and as they become more and more identified as Nintendo's trademark, they've wanted to be less and less risky. It's like Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse was a super crazy adventure character, then he came, became kind of a corporate mascot, though they will still occasionally do some cool, adventurous, weird stuff with the character of Mickey Mouse. But they don't want to offend parents too much and hurt their corporate brand. So uh, I like this comic. I really enjoyed it. It's kind of in a raw, childlike style. I think the closest thing I've seen to it in manga may be Crayon Shin-chan, where characters will have really wonky expressions for humor. But it, it, it also feels westernized. You could read this without knowing the two names on the front and think this is just a western comic that they might have made for Nintendo Power. I love that it opens with the Mario Brothers singing a theme song for their plumbing business. You can't really sing this, the famous Mario Brothers theme to this, so I just made up my own song to it. Uh, they, they foreshadow a bit what kind of character Princess, Peach, Princess Toadstool is by calling her a persnickety party planner. Mario and Luigi love their job. I love that they're plumbers and kind of blue-collar dudes. I love these kind of little moments where he starts out cute and then it transforms into a kind of hideous, hyper-masculine face. So as they're fixing the pipes... Uh, Bowser. They don't call him King Koopa in this. They call him Bowser. Bowser attacks, and uh, plan he plans to kidnap Princess Peach. The I'm not used to that. Princess Toadstool. My my head cannon. I had Tumblr head cannons. My head cannon is she's she's Princess Peach of Toadstool. So both could be acceptable names. So if I slip it back into it, don't worry about it. So I like that the Goombas in this have less of that mushroom shape and have more of that acorn shape. Uh, Swoopers, I love the design of Swoopers. I didn't know them until Paper Mario because I never got a Super NES, but most of these are great Mario enemies from the first four games. And uh, I love that, where is it? Later, Bowser starts rapping. They are having fun with this, and it's cartoony in its style and in its humor, right? So, you know, Luigi gets his butt, get, a monster bites Luigi's butt. Uh, Mario hops on them. They they improvise a weapon of him firing a Goomba at all. It, it's cartoony. And Princess to Toadstool shows us her feistiness in first how she speaks and then how she acts. So her actions mar mat match her words. And uh, then here's Bowser's rap. They're having so much fun with this. Uh, 
then, okay, this is what I'm talking about. So Princess Peach dives off the castle, and then two toads actually run, route run her, get to the bottom, and to make a trampoline for her so she can poof and land on point, and then chase after him and dive and single handedly dive down the pipe to go after Bowser her, herself. So at this point in the character's history, uh, Princess Peach has just been pixels on a screen before this, and for the purpose of humor, uh, Kentaro Takakuma has decided to make Princess Peach more heroic and badass than even the Mario Brothers are, because this is a humor book. Look at this. If if you saw this and thought this was made by white men, you could imagine the BuzzFeed articles about how racist this is. But two Japanese, a, a Japanese writer and artist, come up with the idea of this kind of character. And who cares if it's a racial caricature? It's silly. It's fun. They're they're having humor. I don't care if there's internalized racism against about Asian stereotypes. Let them have some fun. Let them tell a story. Give people a break. Uh, after Mario, he, Mario was turned into stone by Bowser, and after he's cured, they go down the pipe and after him. And I like how there's a thick line around Mario, and there's very dainty lines for the landscape below. That tells us that they're high in the air. I like their scream wrapping around the straight line of their descent to the ground. And, of course, they discover a Yoshi, and that's the end of that chapter. So one of the things I'm thinking about with these characters is they start out as not characters at all. They start out as pixels for a game you're supposed to play. And my favorite uh, I, my favorite version of these characters is from the Paper Mario games. Paper Mario for the N64, Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door for the, the Nintendo GameCube. When I was a little kid, I, I, I haven't played Paper Mario and the Seven Stars Paper, so what is it? Super Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars for Super Nintendo. One of my earliest memories is I remember going into Best Buy with my parents, and I had saved up all my money from doing extra chores, and I had to decide between an, a on-sale Super Nintendo, and they were showing Donkey Kong Country 2 on the TV screen at Best Buy, or I had to choose between a brand new N64, and I think what sold me was... Uh, Super Mario 64 and seeing him flying. That that was what determined Little Me's sale, that I wanted an N64. So I missed all the Super Nintendo classics, but uh, N64 became kind of my childhood. And then, uh, so, boy, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just having all these random childhood memories. My parents made me read a book for every hour I'd want to play a video game. So I would read lots of books during the week so I could save up time to play Mario games on the weekends on the N64. And Paper Mario and... Okay, now, tangent gone, now let's get to the point. Paper, Paper Mario and Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door are excellent stories, and they create all three of the main Mario cast as characters. And in some ways, uh, those... Those two games are Princess Peach's story, even though Mario is the main character you play. The character who has an, a story arc that relates to who she is is Princess Peach in both of those games. And in both of those games, they play with the idea of what Princess Peach does as a captive of Bowser and how she works and who to change to to, to help her bad circumstances and who she is and. The Princess Peach of that, that series is very different from this Princess Peach. They're two different characters, really. This is tough battle axe action girl, uh, Princess Toadstool. And the Princess Peach of the Paper Mario games is this incredibly sympathetic and incredibly uh, what kind character who cares about the people she meets and her kindness and her intelligence are what enable her to essentially save Mario in both of those games. In Paper Mario N64, Mario ends up not being able to defeat Bowser. Princess Peach's relationship with Twink is what is the deciding crucial factor which allows Mario to defeat Bowser. In Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door, Princess Peach is always active, uh, trying to kind of uh, commit espionage on her kidnappers to pass information on to Mario. She has another relationship where she feels empathy for this computer that's captured her. She's an incredible character in those two games. And what I keep thinking of is if feminists got their way, those kinds of stories wouldn't be allowed to be told because technically she'd be kidnapped. Technically Pe Peach gets t kidnapped in these stories, but Mario also gets kidnapped. Who cares? Who cares if a character gets kidnapped? Just tell a story. 
It doesn't have to, it doesn't change the political world. It's not going to change the course of human history and lead to the oppression of women. But anyway, I'm going to save that for more feminist videos. Let's just, now that I've gotten that angry feminist rant out of my system, let's actually dig into this comic and why I like it. So, uh, Yoshi is born and I've got to, it's tough for me because I kind of want to tell you the story, but I also want to keep an eye out for compositional things. It's very straightforward, you know, rectangle, 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 square, rectangle. So it doesn't do much weird experimental stuff with the panel composition, but uh, the art is so expressive and dynamic. It's, uh, it's cartoony art that allows these really simple characters to do... All, kind, all kinds of action-adventure things, and it consistently keeps the tone of humor, right? So every time they, they fight, you know, like they get poked in the butt or they fall into the lava, it, it's that kind of silly childlike humor. Ha ha, he, he hit his butt. It, it's so funny, tee hee. And they'll have random things like this dude show up, a, a salesman named Friendly Floyd who has a very humanoid face, and he chinses them into buying a Yoshi language book where they, they imitate that sort of charming, simple illustration style of learn a language books and everything is Yoshi. Hello? Yoshi! How are you? Yoshi? Fine, thank you, Yoshi. <laughs> and then it is revealed that Princess Peach was kidnapped while they were exploring Yoshi Town. Uh, in Bowser's castle, he is having a wedding cake prepared and he's haranguing the seven Koopalings, I think they're called. And in this version, they're his children, and he wants Princess Peach to be their mother. They go to check on Princess Peach, and they think she's escaped, so they go in, and ninja-like, she's crawled up the wall and has waited for a moment, and then she dives down and starts kicking butt and makes a run for it, and they all go after her. Meanwhile, uh, Mario and Luigi are just stuck uh, trying to cross the moat, and they can't get past the, the piranhas. And uh, this, this theme of Princess Peach Kicking butt and taking names is continued. You know, she dives up the stairs, gets into, uh, I don't I don't know all the Koopalings' names, but she gets into the girl Koopa's room and threatens to destroy her stuff. Uh, Pr Princess Peach runs to the window and realizes she's trapped and then accidentally falls down. Man, look at all this. Uh, low angles, high angles, excitement, adventure. Uh, the, the cape turns into a parachute just like it does in the games and she floats to safety. Now... One thing I've noticed is that thus far, Mario and Luigi have been pretty effective adventurers. Luigi sits on a cannon and Mario goes to rescue Luigi, but as a result, he is blasted right past Princess Peach into the Koopa captors, into the Koopa castle. So now Mario is in danger, Mario is in distress, and Princess Peach is safe with Luigi. So is Mario a manzel in distress, like Princess Peach is sometimes a damsel in distress? Who cares? It, no, he's not because he's he, he got into the situation kind of by accident. He's been trying to act heroically. He hasn't been reduced to a character with no personality who's just there for Pit Princess Toadstool to save. This is comedy. It's funny, it, it's funny because of how ironic the situation is. Mario went to save Toadstool. Toadstool got out. Mario went in. Now Mario's in trouble. You don't have to get... If you're so MGTOWs and MRAs can sometimes get bent out of shape the way feminists do. So a MGTOW might be saying, "Oh, this is terrible. This is emasculating Mario. Oh, this is this is gynocentrism. This is matriarchy." But take it easy. It's just a story. It's hilarious. It's fun. And as we're going to see, Mario isn't just reduced to a manzel in distress. He remains a active and heroic character. So uh, Bowser's upset that Peach has escaped and. I think someone's home. And then Floyd shows up with makeup, and Luigi gets a bright idea, and then uh, he appears from, someone appears from the bush looking like Princess Peach, and then a mysteriously masked Princess Peach shows up at the castle to talk to the Koopalings. I really like how, if if you're story savvy, you know that Luigi has disguised himself as Princess Peach to infiltrate Bowser's castle. But if you were a little kid, it might be possible for you to to still be surprised by this next issue. Now they kind of give they kind of give the gag away in the summary by letting you know that Luigi disguised himself as Princess Peach to infiltrate. This one opens with a dream sequence where uh, Princess Toadstool is imagining marrying Mario, and then it changes to. 
uh, Bowser and it's a nightmare and then she wakes up and she's dressed in Luigi's outfit and she looks cute. Uh, Luigi is captured and uh, he, oh, this is, it's so funny to read. I'm not going to read this, read this to you, but just imagining, you know, Luigi's voice saying this stuff, trying to imitate a girl's voice. It's hilarious and it's problematic because he's dressed up as a woman and that's transphobic, I guess. But he, Luigi manages to brass his way out and convince Bowser that he's actually in love with him and that he's got a cold, so they should let, let him keep his mask on. Uh, Luigi finds Mario and they uh, prepare to bust him out. Uh, he, they order pizza and then when the pizza delivery shows up, guy shows up, it's Princess Peach in Luigi's outfit with a whole bunch of bombs. So the, the theme of her being tough, tough action girl is continued. Uh, more cartoon hijinks as they battle with each other and Luigi gets himself in a tight spot. Yoshi looks, Yoshi kicks butt. Luigi is consistent. So Ouija is consistently kind of flustered and flummoxed and uh, behind the eight ball or what is he? He's, he's a coward, but he's a coward who does the brave thing when it counts. So I guess he's just a nervous personality who is a fraidy cat, but will still dive into the adventure when, when he's needed. Uh, there's this cool sort of tough situation where if, if, if Princess Toadstool lights the bomb, I keep wanting to say Princess Peach, so I'm just going to like forget about that hang up and I'll just call her Princess Peach or Princess Toadstool and not worry about it too much. So, uh, if she lights the bomb, she's going to blow all them up. So, uh, she calls Pr Princess Peach's bluff and then Peach says, well, it'll be worth it. If I got, if I go out, then I go out fighting you guys and Mario and Luigi then show up to, uh, come to their aid, but uh, immediately they're trapped and they fall down and the, the bomb gets lit by accident and everything blows up. Uh, there's this cool little fake out where they say the end, but then they realize they haven't actually gotten away from Bowser yet. They send one of the toads to get a rescue team, but that rescuer, the rescuers turn out to be working for Bowser. And once again, Princess Peach is kidnapped. Uh, Yoshi gets some wings by eating a toads, a, what do you call him? Flying Koopa. And then they fl fall down in front of a uh, mysterious, creepy castle, which Bowser has clearly left as a trap for them. There's this cool little scene where Bowser explains why it's inevitable they're going to fall into his trap. And then Mario uses sim similar language to explain why he's sure this is a trap. And then they, they all have the reaction that B Bowser was wrong. But Luigi being an idiot, he smells cheese and he can't resist, even though Mario's warned him it's a trap. So in he runs and they all fall, they, they all fall into Bowser's trap. And I really like the idea of Boos. They were kind of scary enemies in the, the old 8-bit games. And it's kind of cute how they're scary and then they're cute and shy when you look at them. Uh, Mario and Luigi are kind of smart and put their backs against the wall to try to not give the Boos an opportunity to sneak up on them. And uh, while that, so more wedding preparations, the wizard is hypnotizing toads, and the, there's some cartoon hijinks to get away from the booze. Mario and Luigi disguise themselves as a nurse and a doctor and help the, the big boo sort through his emotional issues that make him want to bully them. And then they leave the, they leave the mansion all happy and uh, have Big Boo has resolved his inner turmoil because Mario gave him some spiel about the universe. Mario really got into character as a psychologist. And then off they go to save the day and, re and stop the wedding for Princess Peach. Uh, they go through some lava and Mario and Luigi get separated. So it's, it's all going to come together. So Peach is still being her feisty self who will not back down and they have to hypnotize her to get her to e e even just like say the words they want her to say at, at the wedding ceremony. So she's brainwashed. They're kind of hinting that Bowser's kind of that comedic perv character in a few scenes and they do it in such a way where it could have a G-rated context. Like he wants to see her wedding dress, but the... Probably what is implied is he wants to see her getting dressed in her wedding dress. He get, grabs a camera to record her saying, I love you, Bowser. But it's probably because he's sort of that per, that Japanese comedic pervy type character. Uh, Mario jumps in right as the 
uh, wedding, you know, when they say speak now or forever, hold your peace, inverse Mario, and uh, the fight, the fight is on. While Mario is fighting Bowser, Luigi is rescuing the Yoshis. I like where he remembers them hatching the Yoshi by accident, and there's a single panel with color separation. So he's in his, you know, normal colors, green and blue. The background is blue tones, so we can separate these in our mind. And then simple arrows just to help us get the idea that he is thinking, thinking, thinking. He puts two and two together, and they start rescuing the Yoshis that are in the egg. Uh, Luigi he, Luigi leads the charge of Yoshi's over Bowser's forces. Uh, Mario, and Peach wakes up and Mario goes after Bowser for this big battle on top of the wedding cake and it all falls down and Mario gets a little kiss at the end. So problematic. It. This is fun. This is adventurous. This is this is childlike. It's somewhat childish, but uh, it is. It is taking little simple ideas of characters and actually telling a comedic version of the hero goes to save the princess story with some humor and some whimsy. This isn't going to turn someone into a toxically masculine uh, member of the rape culture. And, oh, the thought I had was that a lot of people compare the new third wave feminist left to kind of the religious right of the 80s. And Jack Thompson at, and his... Uh, attempts to censor violent video games gets brought up a lot. And the thought I've always had is, in some ways, the third wave feminist left is worse than Jack Thompson. Because at least Jack, Jack Thompson, I think his argument was wrong. I don't think violent video games cause children to go out and shoot people. But at least he, you could say violent video games exist. The feminist argument seems to be that this kind of a story where the hero rescues the girl and the girl gives the hero a little smooch. Well, this teaches toxic masculinity and rape culture. And so the problem with this is I can't even see, you can't even see the connection. Almost, almost every normal person who just in, enjoys a Mario game is going to hear that argument that this causes, this causes patriarchy and say, what? what? How, how do you get from here to oppression of women? What's, what, how do we get from point A to point B? And the only way for you to be inoculated with that is you need to be educated to the point where you can be stupid enough to believe it. You need to be educated with all the feminist books, which are written with a large vocabulary, but don't particularly have much to say until that idea sounds viable to you. And it sounds like something you could buy. It is something that sounds viable when you hear like the really rational academic feminist types try to make that argument. But it, it, it leads you to absurd places. It, while it's true that you could you could argue about patriarchy or you could argue about the oppression of women in a way that sounds rational and doesn't result in a lot of weird, nasty behavior, uh, it, it, it's also true that this school of thought has led people to complete absurdity where Mario and Peach are viewed as the most problematic thing in society that we need to fix. It needs to be fixed because everything's homophobic and racist and sexist, and you have to point it all out. Huh. So the the first 12 chapters were published in Nintendo Power from uh, throughout the year of 1992, from January to December, and this was published in the first issue of Nintendo Power in 1993. I like my boy, Wario. Just like Wario, I'm kind of saying, wah, a lot when I hear feminist talks, wah, wah. And there's this charming thing where Mario remembers a nice childhood with Wario, but Wario remembers all the bad things that Mario has forgotten about, and he wants revenge. So Mario meets three baddies on the way to Wario's house, and then, uh, then he meets Wario himself, and uh, Wario has blown himself up like a balloon to fight Mario. Man, this is like, what's it? Game theory, Wario is 10 feet tall theory, and then Wario ends up being just like a few inches taller than Mario, and he's a little cutie. Yeah, but, but then Mario asked to play ca sh uh, Cowboys and Bandits again, and, cow and Mario gets to be the sheriff, and Wario has to be the bandit. So he, he, Mario hasn't changed. He's still kind of, he's a little pushy. He was a little pushy as a kid, and he's a little pushy as an adult. It's comedy. It, it was a fun little gag. And, oh, I wanted to read some of this. So this is where they told you a bit about the publication of this in Nintendo Power. Uh, most of the characters do come from some Mario game. I was really interested about this. Okay, Charlie Noza uh, Nozawa, the artist who created the comics, is known in Japan by the pen name Tamakichi Sakura. His most notable works include Shiawase no Katachi, Shapes of Happiness, and 
Oyaji no Wakusei, Dad's Planet. Okay, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. I'm sure some manga site might have trans, fan translations of those. Kentaro Takekuma dreamed up the scenario. He is best known for co-authoring Even a Monkey Can Draw Manga, which Even a Monkey Can Draw, I learned this from reading a k co comic, but that's the Japanese equivalent of uh, for dum the For Dummies books in America. So, sorry guys, this was a little bit rambly one about feminism. Uh, I, I recommend this. It's it's child it's childlike in both the content of the story and in the drawing quality, but it's charming. This is a charming piece of Mario history, and I would especially recommend the Paper Mario games if you haven't played those two yet, because I think those might be the Mario characters at, at maybe at the height of, of them being real characters with some heroism and some personality and telling a story with stakes. So, until then, remember, when you talk to a feminist, wah, wah, wah.